Okay, uh, today we will start with separate compilation and writing make files and clean up to the extent we need for most of this course. After that, we will do a small module on iterators. So, how do you create a configuration of variables and step through a space of their values systematically while maintaining state inside an iterator? Okay, we'll see three uh, applications of that. But first, we'll talk about separate compilation. Suppose you are uh, creating a library called mylib, and you are going to provide three functions uh, as part of that library. Perhaps you decide to separate out the three functions in three different source files. So fun1 is the source code for it appears in fun1.cpp and so on. Now mylib.hpp is what you declare as your contribution to the outside world. So mylib.hpp only has the function signatures but not the implementation or the body of the function. mylib.hpp is used by your functions as well as by people who are going to use it later on. Each of your fun1.cpp, fun2.cpp, and fun3.cpp, hash includes mylib.hpp. Okay? And then it provides an implementation of fun1, this provides an implementation of fun2, and so on. When you compile these with the command g++ minus c whatever dot cpp, that turns this file into an object file. This object file is binary code, but they don't have a main method defined, and therefore they cannot be run by the system directly. Okay? They are just compiled binary code for each of the provided functions. And those are the .o files. .o extension is standard. You cannot name it to something else generally, unless you take great pains. So there's no point doing it. Similarly, the input is either CPP or CC. That's standardized. Now, if your library has only one .o file, then you may not bother to do anything more with it. You just give users the .o file and the .hpp file. But most often what happens is for large non-trivial libraries, you end up with a lot of .o files. Then you use a command called the archiver or ar. C is create this file if it doesn't exist. And r is replace, meaning if the file if the archive file already existed, but you gave more arguments .o files, the archive will replace the internal file with the given file, sort of like a zip option. And then you give all these .o files, and those will be packed into the archive. So effectively, mylib.a is a file which packs all the .o files one after the other, and it also adds a table of contents. So the table of contents is a small table somewhere in the file mylib.a, which specifies what functions are provided with their binary signatures. Okay. And those binary signatures have to be compatible with whatever HPP you're also giving to end users of your library. If they get out of sync, then you'll have problem in linking later on. So that's as far as you go in creating the library. So eventually the product of your work is this file mylib.a, and mylib.hpp. When a customer comes and uses your library, they write something like a main.cpp, which will also hash include mylib.hpp. And once that is compiled to main.o, main.o and mylib.a have to be linked together. This is the linking step. That can also be done by G++ with the suitable flags. So the two G++ or the three G++ fags which are important are minus i, minus l, and minus l. So in this particular case, suppose main.cpp is in some directory and mylib.hpp has been unpacked after buying the software in some other directory, then G++ has to be told where to look for mylib.hpp. You could do it in two ways. Either the hash include statement in main.cpp has to specify the 
complete path. That is not a very portable option because if you take your code to a different machine, the path might change. So instead, what is more common to do is that the hash include statement only has mylib.hpp, but the path where mylib.hpp should be found is specified here in the dash i directive. Okay? And in particular, we shall see how this path is actually injected by the make file. So it appears only once in a make file or maybe even in what's called an environment variable in your shell, which we will get to a little later. Now the second set of options is this. Now depending on how your library is installed, you may or may not use to need to use the dash l flags. In case your mylib.a lives in some directory that you own and you can easily get into, the best the easiest thing to do is to say this linking step is just g++ main.o and mylib.a. That will work. g++ will understand that this is one object file, but this is an archive of multiple object files. It will try to compile, try to look into main.o. Main.o will generally have what are called unresolved references. Main.o will use functions from mylib which it doesn't define. And then G++ will look at every such function which is required by main.o but not defined there. And it will look up that name with its function signature in mylib.a. That's why the table of contents is provided. If it finds a matching function provided by uh, lib, mylib.a, it will link between those two codes. What's linking? Some time back we saw how function calls are made. The code for main may start at address 1000. The code for abs may start at 2000. mylib.a records the fact that the function for abs start at 2000. Linking involves fixing those addresses so that when a call to abs is made from main.o to a function in mylib.a, the addresses are correctly patched up in the resulting executable, that is main.exe. Okay. So if you don't give any argument to G++, a.out will be saved. There's nothing special in the name a.out. You can name it anything. In particular, in the Windows world, executables finish with .exe extension, and you might want to do the same. Okay. So that's the whole story of separate compilation. Now, how about make files? So the problem with this scheme is, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So your .hpp file and your source cpp files will generally use namespaces. And that namespace information will be packaged in the .a file as well, automatically. The namespace information will be retained so that when you make outcalls from main.o into the library, it will go by the whole namespace, the whole path. Okay. So another point is that uh, this .a file and the final link step is efficient in the sense that if mylib.a provided thousands of functions, but your main.o only used three, only those will be copied from mylib.a into main.exe. You will not copy everything that is provided by mylib.a. You will only copy things that main.o requires for its running. Okay. So the problem with this setup, it's efficient because you compile each source only once. You package it up with a table of contents, which can be efficiently looked up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the problem is in maintaining all this. So if there are hundreds of files in the library, and I have here shown a very flat organization, it may well happen that fun2 actually uses fun1. There could be a complicated dependency uh, structure between the files themselves. Uh, we write something like you know, how to find an LU factorization that is used by a Gaussian elimination code which is used by an inverting code, as you have seen earlier. Okay. If you have that sort of dependencies within the library itself, and there are hundreds of files, if one file changes, who's going to keep track of how to issue the right bash commands so that mylib.a is updated to the correct, most fresh um, library file? Okay. So that is where make comes in. In make, you declare these dependencies as you start writing the source code. 
It goes lockstep with writing the source code itself. You understand which function depends on which function, and therefore which file depends on which file. You enter that into a make file. So just like in case of a C++ program, main is a standard defined name. It's the entry point of control when you start your program. Similarly, if you run make from the command line, it looks for a file called either make file with a capital M or a small m. Inside make file, there is a sequence of rules. The order in which the rules are written doesn't matter. We will see what actually matters. But every rule has this form of a target colon dependency list. So if you figure out that fun 2o depends on fun 2cpp and mylib.hpp, you will say fun 2o colon fun 2.cpp and mylib.hpp. The left hand side depends on each item on the right hand side. The right hand side is a space separated list of targets. Okay. Now after a rule, you write down an action, which is one or more bash commands, which will refresh the left hand side based on whatever change on the right hand side. So, so here is uh, an example. I have written Gaussian.cpp to print matrices either in the intermediate stages or at the end. It uses a matrix printer library which exports a matrix printer.hpp and a matrix printer.o which in turn is compiled from matrix printer.cpp. Okay. So this half of the picture belongs to the library writer. The left half belongs to the client or the customer of the library. So the make file takes a formal specification of dependencies. And in case anything changes, suppose that originally everything was compiled to be fresh, and then I went and changed matrix printer.hpp. Maybe I forgot to declare a const for the input matrix, and I decided that I should add a const. Then that affects both my implementation, matrix printer.o, as well as the customer's code. So both of them have to be compiled and then finally linked into the executable file. Whereas if the interface remained the same and I only changed matrix printer.cpp to say do column alignment or some other better implementation of printing, then the only thing I need to recompile is matrix printer.cpp into matrix printer.o. But once matrix printer.o changes, you have to trigger a recompilation and relinking of the final exe file. Okay. So roughly speaking, no matter how you specify the rules and actions in your make file, make will go and compose a graph like this. Then from the bottom upward, it will check every edge to see if the lower node has a timestamp which is newer than the upper node. If that is the case, then make will rerun the rule to construct the upper node. This in turn may make other edges invalid. So it will move upward in a web front and fix every edge that seems to be out of date until the root node is fixed and generated fresh. Okay. So this is what a make file looks like. So in this directory, okay, just like main is uh, the standard input control point of your program, the standard final target of a make file is called all. When you invoke make from bash without an argument, you implicitly mean make all, make the target all fresh. So make reads this and say, okay, to make all fresh, what do we have to ensure? I have to ensure that vector user.exe is fresh. What does vector user.exe depend on? It depends on vector user.o and libvp. This is the li library of vector printers, dot a. Okay. Now this cryptic line basically says, run G++ in a linker mode with a dash o flag, dollar at corresponds to the left hand side. So I don't have to type it again. If you want, you can always type vector user dot exe, it doesn't make a difference. Dollar at is equivalent, synonymous to the left hand side. It's just a shorthand, you need not use it. And dollar caret is the list on the right hand side. Again, it's a shorthand, it's convenience for typing and avoiding mistakes. So instead you could just say, Compile and link into vector user.exe the files vector user.o and libvp.a. Okay. 
Now, how is libvp.a created? Well, in my case, I don't have fun1, fun2, and fun3. I only have one object file which prints a vector, vector printer.o. And I do this archive creation. If the archive already exists, then I replace the file vector printer.o in it by the given file. So this line is just a standard command as you would print on bash. And there could be more than one lines. Vector user.o in turn is created from cpp and vector printer.hpp. Any one of them changes, you have to re redo vector user.o. How do you do that? You do g c vector user.cpp. Similarly, vector printer depends on the cpp and hpp files and is recompiled. What is this? You can define any arbitrary variable like include directory, like I was saying there, dash i, okay, as a string, and then you can reuse it with a dollar curly integer any place you need it. This makes it convenient to specify include directories for downloaded packages, define it only once at the top, and then reuse it in any compiling or linking command throughout the file. Okay. Uh, in this case, home foo has nothing, it doesn't matter. Uh, an include directory is not checked for existence. If it doesn't exist, it's silently ignored. Okay. So, and finally, there's this other rule called clean. So the default rule is all, but when you invoke make, you can really put any target on the make line. You can say make, you can say make all, which is the same thing. Or you can say make vector user.exe. You can give the target explicitly also. If you don't give a target, then the default target is assumed to be all. Okay. Now, I can always define a target called clean, which depends on nothing. So if the right hand side is empty, it says clean doesn't depend on anything. What does it do? So it always, you know, you can say that it has to always run, provided those things are available. Okay. So it removes vector user.exe vp.a, vector user.o, and vector printer.o. So all the files that were created by the compiler and linker, you're cleaning up so that you can start from scratch. Now observe the minus here. The leading minus tells RM that if the file does not exist or there is some other error in removing that file, ignore the error and continue on to the next line. So because clean is supposed to be a robust, you know, carpet bombing operation, you, you want to remove everything that exists. Something that doesn't exist shouldn't disturb you. It should just go on and remove everything that is created as temporary files. So of course, be very careful in writing clean rules because if you accidentally put in your .cpp files in the RM list, it'll just go, okay? So be careful about writing these clean rules. All right, so now if we go in here, currently it has all the temporary files, libvp, et cetera, so I'll do a make clean. So it removes vector user dot and all that. There's no error because all the files existed. Now suppose I say make, make will first you know, pass that argument, but it doesn't matter. Vector user dot cpp, then it compiles vector printer dot cpp, then it creates the archive libvp dot a out of vector printer dot o only, but it could be fun1, fun2, fun3 dot o. And finally it links into vector user dot exe, vector user dot o with libvp dot a. Now, what does libvp.a look like? See that libvp.a has 2.8 kilobytes in it approximately. Vector printer.o has about 2.5 kilobytes. Okay. So the only contents of libvp.a is vector printer.o and the table of contents. So the table of contents has taken about 200 some bytes. Okay. Now, how does libvp.a look like? Of course, it will complain that it's a binary file. If you still insist on seeing it, that's what a .a file looks like. Okay, it's all kinds of binary machine instruction garbage, but you see some strings inlined in there, right? See, I de declared a function called print, and so that's somehow enabled in, embedded in the table of contents, okay? And inside there is also the function signature of print, so it knows that print will take a vector as an input. If you start calling it from vector user with a different signature, this is the place where the signatures are compared. If the function input and output types don't match, you cannot pluck it out of libvp.a and use it. So all the input and output types are embedded in this binary file, and it knows what to do there, okay? Um, all right, and it also knows that this file came from vectorprinter.o. Okay, so the, so the object file vectorprinter.o contributed this function called print. 
which takes a vector as an input. So if you want to find out the other gibberish meaning, then you have to consult the manuals for how .a files are organized. Okay. But if you want a slightly more printable version of this, you can try to say strings, live vp.a and see what you get. You get a lot of things. It's probably a better way to read it. Okay. So it says, it defines a function called print, um, which takes a vector. Okay. It's provided by that. It was compiled by GCC, version so and so on a Debian system. It has a symbol table, it has a string table, it has a data segment, okay, it has a stack segment. So those are all the comments made. How much data segment does it need? How much stack segment does it need? So this is all the bookkeeping for passing parameters between the caller and the callee. All that is embedded here. Okay. So how things are initialized, how things are destroyed, how the I.O. system is initialized. So all, all this is part of the binary file. So all this is fascinating in compiler design and Runtime system design. Okay, so that's how you write a make file. Okay. And as you've already seen, um, here we declared vector printer as print of that. Okay. Uh, and you have this norm2. Okay, let me remove the norm2. No one is implementing it yet. Okay. Now, one thing you observe is I've added these funny lines at the top and bottom. Okay. Suppose I take them away. So the header file only defines that there's a function called print defined in the std namespace. Okay. Now suppose I also define some kind of a void foo, just a function. Okay. Now no one tells you that you cannot actually define the body of your function here either. Suppose I do that. So you're free to implement the function entirely in the header file. It's just a little inefficient to do that because your compiler will compile it every time you scan the header file. Okay. Now if I do that, and then I have vector user dot cpp. Okay. Now let's do one small experiment. I included vector. Let's say by mistake I include vector the second time. Okay. I'm only including a definition, so including it the second time shouldn't make a difference. So I do that, and sure enough, nothing changes. Everything, the build goes through fine. Now suppose instead of that, I make the mistake with the header file I wrote. I include vector printer.hpp twice. So hash includes are not handled directly by the C++ compiler. Any line starting with a hash actually goes to what's called a C preprocessor. The preprocessor says that, well, at this line you wanted to include this other file. I'm going to remove this line and in, in its place, I'm going to include the contents of that file. And that goes to the compiler. So it's one stage after another. The preprocessor only looks for hash lines and deals with that. It's a small language. And once the contents of the right-hand side file is included in that position, then it's passed on to the actual compiler. So in other words, if you include vector printer.hpp twice, that whole file is literally included at that position twice over. And then that goes to the C++ compiler. So now let's try to make it. This time it says redefinition of void std foo. And that's because it looked at this file once, it found a definition of the function foo. It looked at it again, it found another definition of function foo. Just like here, if you define main again, the C++ compiler will be unhappy. You are not supposed to define main twice, or anything, any function twice. Okay. So now, uh, what to do about it? The reason why this is not an artificial situation is that you could well have multiple inclusions in the following form. So you may easily have a file called h1.hpp, which includes h2.hpp. Okay. And then you might have u.cpp, you know, accidentally include both of them. So to avoid problems like these, that's why we uh, generate that initial directive. So what the first line says, so you have to find some magic string which you're fairly sure doesn't appear anywhere else in your system. Okay. So I'll say if the following variable is not defined, typically people use the uppercase version of the file name, okay, but not necessarily, you can put anything there. Only if that is not defined should you process the rest of the file. And inside, you immediately define that same variable. It doesn't matter what that variable is defined to. All you're saying is that that variable is now known. 
to the preprocessor. Okay. So this ensures that the first time around, vector printer is found undefined, it is defined, and this content is inlined into the code. The second time that I make a mistake and include it again, vector printer is found to be defined and the rest of this file is ignored. Okay, so writing header file, this is very standard in C and C++. So this time if I make it, it will go through fine. Because the second inclusion is ignored. Because of that flag. So what did you see new today? We saw how, yeah. Because vector already has something like that inside. If you look at how vector is implemented, so vector can be found in user include C++, uh, okay, vector, okay, there's a lot of boilerplate, there we go. You can define it to one if you want, it doesn't matter. So any standard header file will immediately define some weird string like this. Now this is not foolproof because that string may accidentally appear in some other header file and start interference between the two. But it's one device to avoid multiple inclusions. Okay? Yes. Hmm. Yes. So I don't know the exact binary format, but uh, as we saw, some things are already clear. It tells you which .o file contributed to it and what. Okay, and this this is a complicated binary format which records the input arguments, output arguments, how to pass the parameters on the stack, all kinds of internal details. In fact, it even has data about the CPP file which created the .o file. Okay. This is because this is to do debugging. So the information after this, this contains correspondence information between source C++ lines and .o machine instructions. So that when you are stepping through the code in a debugger, as you'll soon do, it can build a correspondence between the object file and the source. So they can show you with a cursor where you are running in the source. That is, all this is automatically created. You don't have to think about it. Okay. okay. So the new things we saw today are protection against multiple inclusion using hash defines, okay. Uh, some details of make files, including defining string variables for reuse anywhere, uh, how to define targets, left hand side, right hand side actions, how to declare additional targets for cleaning up the space, and how to ignore errors. So you would like to ignore errors in a cleanup operation, but of course if you had multiple commands in any of the other rules, if there's an error, you would like to stop early so that you find the problem at the first step. So generally speaking in G++ or AR, you don't want to put a leading minus. You want to fail quickly and fix the problem, okay? All right, so in this week's lab, we are taking it a little easy. You'll just practice run, writing make files, building a small library of your own with four .o files, and then using it from a simple client code, main.cpp. Okay. Um, the next thing we will look at is this business of iterators. So what are iterators? So far we have already seen one important class of iterators and that is an index into an array or a vector. We have seen sorting, searching, merging, all kinds of operations where we were iterating over an array. Okay. So what is an iterator? Uh, in this case, the iterator is the integer ix. ix, in this particular simple example, goes from 0 to the size of the array, increasing by 1. And now inside the loop, you can access array ix as either left-hand side or right-hand side. You can write into it, read from it, and so on. But in general, there may not be such a simple notion of a single index. The space you are iterating over need not be a linear sequence of integers. For example, in later lectures, once we start looking at sparse mappings, like hash tables, we will see that you may want to iterate over the elements of a hash map, a mapping between, say, people's names and their age. Okay. Or already in the context of sparse arrays that we have seen, 
you may want to get an iterator which gives you pairs of dimensions and values. Okay. Or maybe you are designing something like a chess puzzle or something and you want to iterate through all board positions of n non-attacking queens on an n by n chessboard, which is of course closely related to iterating through all permutations of n items or all permutation matrices of size n by n. Okay. So suppose I want to iterate through all permutation matrices of size n by n, which means that every row and every column is allowed to have exactly one, one on it. That's like the queen. Okay. How do you iterate through all this systematically? And very often, these classes of iteration problems, which walk through a configuration space systematically, you could write them very easily if only you could write a variable number of nested for loops. So here's an example. Um, and we already saw code for that last time somewhat hastily. So I want to count through all uh, values of a number. Now, uh, very early in the course, we started looking at binary counting. So suppose I have a four-bit binary number starting at 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. Now, if I have to increment it, if I have to iterate to the next value, what do I do? I start looking from the least significant bit leftward. Okay. I look for the rightmost zero, something that can be incremented, which in this case happens to be this one and I increment it to 0, 0, 0, 0001. It just turns out that the machine hardware knows how to do incrementing on integers. But inside, this is how it works. You look for the rightmost bit which can be incremented, and then you increment it. Now, if I say oh, increment this one, then the rightmost bit that can be incremented is no longer this one, it's this one. Once I increment something, I have to reset everything that's to the right to zeros. So the algorithm is very simple. Scan from the right to the left, find the first incrementable bit, increment it, and zero out everything to the right of it. That is the basic iteration step. So if my CPU had only bit manipulations in it, and it didn't have an integer processing unit, then this is how I would need to implement increments. Okay. Now to generalize this, suppose I tell you that I want to look at all, um, say, two digit radix three numbers. You want to iterate through that space. Okay. What is two digit radix three numbers? So every digit can now be 0, 1, or 2. Just like in radix 10, a digit can be 0 through 9. Okay. So the first number will be 0, 0, second number will be 0, 1, third number will be 0, 2. At this point, I cannot increment this any further. So I need to roll over, carry over to the next, and reset that. Okay. Right. And then we will have 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2. So how many numbers will you have? You have radix to the power num digits. Okay. So, so many configurations. Now, the way I want to write the code is don't assume you're starting at this value. The way I want to write the code is you're given an arbitrary state and you want to walk to the next state. Okay? So once we know how to do that for complicated configuration spaces, we can write all kinds of non-trivial code. So um, to give you the sort of abstract view of an iterator, yes. So what's an iterator in an abstract term? You can initialize it. In particular, for the number case, we might initialize it to all zeros, but not necessarily. Given any state of the iterator, we can ask if there is a next state, or we are the, we are the last possible state, and we have run out of states. If you're iterating through, it, through an array, then that test for next is whether you have gone past n or not, the size. Okay. If you're incrementing numbers stored in arbitrary radix format, there is a next state if any of the digits is less than the maximum possible. That's the test for whether there is a next. If there is a next state, there has to be a method or a function which will move the iterator from the current to the next state. 
And finally, in some cases, you need to fetch and modify data which is associated with the current state of the iterator. For example, if you have an iterator over a vector, and you are pointing at a certain place in the vector, you may want to read or write or even delete that element, or insert an element at that position and so on. So those are operations you can do on the current state of the iterator. Okay? So any iterator in general provides these four facilities. Okay. So now let's go back to our example of basically writing a radix 3 odometer, if you will, mile meter on a card, uh, where the least significant bit has to clock up quickly and then more slowly for the other guys. Um, first of all, I have a print routine, which was written slightly badly. So I want to print from the most significant digit down to the least significant digit. That's a print routine, which, okay. And um, so I start off with, say, number of digits equal to 5 and radix 3. So I should get 3 to the power 5 or 243 different numbers. Okay. I stored those digits in an array called digits, which is initialized to n digits, all being 0, the first value. Okay. Now, forever, what do I do? I say print digits, and then I have this code. Which, which calculates what to do next, to go from one to the next. So I'll rewrite this in the following step, okay? If not next number digits break. That's how your iteration code should look like. Initialize the iterator somewhere, then forever print or process the current state of the iterator, and then as long as there is a next state, go over there. So next number goes to the next state, and if there is no next state, it runs false. If, it, if there was a next state that it successfully transitioned to, you return true. So now let's define next number. So next number has to return a Boolean. It modifies digits, so its input is vector int reference digits, okay. inside this is the code. Did I successfully change the state or didn't I? I'll return that uh, at the end. But inside what am I doing here? So I initialize a did change boolean variable to false. Now. I look for a change position from the least significant position of 0 up to n digits minus 1. If the digit at that position change was less than radix minus 1, then I can bump it up. Okay? Then I bump up that digit. I set did change to true because I have succeeded in iterating to the next state. And then for all lower order positions, I set the digit to 0 again. Okay? In case change is 0, then that inner for loop will not even execute. So this is perfectly general code. And if I manage to change something, I break immediately, because I am only supposed to take one step. Fine. So as a code, this is extremely simple. But this is a paradigm. This is not a particular algorithmic skill I'm trying to teach. This is a paradigm of programming, where you understand the space of the state you are maintaining, and you write generic code so that given any configuration, you can update it to the next configuration or return false if you couldn't. That's a pattern. You should recognize that pattern whenever your application demands it and then code it that way. So observe that the code has now become very simple. Okay, the code was, the problem was very simple to start with, so this doesn't make, a, make the point very strongly. Our next two examples will make the point much more strongly. Okay. But the summary is that the main routine now looks very simple. Print the current configuration, move to the next configuration if possible, otherwise break. Fine. So now if I run that, so n digits wasn't declared and radix was not declared, right? So I have to pass those things also. 
Uh, n digits is already known, radix is not known. That should work. So remember this is five digits on radix three. So start with zero, one, two, one zero, one one, one two, two zero, two one, two two, and then one zero zero and so on. So it's a very simple piece of code. Hopefully no, not much debugging is required there. If you want to quickly check if the code looks right, you word count it, the output, you'll find that there are 243 lines as you would expect. So this gives number of lines, number of words, number of characters. So word count is a very simple utility. If instead I want, say, uh, the number of digits is, say, 10, but the radix is 2, I should get 2 to the power 10 values, or 1024 values. Okay, I'll just compile that again. And if I word count this time, I'll get 1024. So that's an example of a very simple iterator, which instead of iterating on one integer, iterates through a tuple of integers, incrementing them in lexicographic or odometer order, right, in any radix. The next example we'll see is uh, more non-trivial, which is uh, given an input n, print all the n factorials of n items. And we'll assume n is less than 27. We'll keep busy for a long time printing all permutations of 27 things. Uh, so we'll name the items to be permitted as the letters A, B, C, et cetera, up to wherever we need to go. Now, uh, one way to think about permutation is placing things on a line in an order. Suppose I have to place three things on a line. The first thing I place is A, and there is no sense of placing A in multiple ways on a line if the only relative positions matter. So A can only be placed in one way on the line, and that way is numbered zero. Okay. And because A is the zeroth element, the way in which it is placed is called way zero. Way zero can only take value zero. Okay. Now once I have placed A, I can place B on the left of it, or I can place B on the right of it. So B is the oneth element, and the way in which it is placed is called way one, which can be either zero or it can be one. So I represent that by a branching out, a decision branch, saying if B goes to the left of A, you come down the left subtree, otherwise you take the right branch and B goes after A. That corresponds to zero for B and one for B. Okay. The third item I am placing is C, which is the twoth item, and its index is called way two, which can now take values zero, one, and two. Because two items have already been placed, three gaps have been created, and this is called gap zero, that's called gap one or gap two, and so way Basically, way two takes one of those three values and decides where C goes. If way two is zero, then C goes to the very left. If way two is one, then C goes in the middle. If way two is two, it goes to the right. Okay. So now you see that the number of possibilities is exactly n factorial, because way zero can take one value, way one can take two values, etc., three values, up to n. So the product of those is the number of leaves in the tree. So there's an one-to-one -one correspondence between n indexing variables such that the ith indexing variable takes values between 0 and i, okay, up to n minus 1, and the actual permutation. So if I gave you a path, any path, 0, 1, 1, there is a canonical representation where you can say, okay, for the sequence 0, 1, 1, I'll give you permutation a, c, b. It's not difficult to compute that permutation because, so I should, the easiest way to do that is to walk from the bottom upward. What do I mean by that? Suppose I give you the sequence 0, 1, 1. Okay. So you say, well, um, I know there are three items, so let me make up three empty slots. And someone told me that 
after two items have been placed, C could have gone in any of those three positions, and C chooses to go to number one. So let me place C there. Then I walk up to its parent, and someone tells me that oh, item B has been placed in position one again. But now, of course, you can't put it there. What it means is the oneth non-empty empty position. So B has to go here, and naturally I will come there. So it's not too difficult to write a piece of code which, given this sequence, walks backward on it and fills up the arrangement and prints it. So all I need now is to fake a bunch of nested loops which will vary way zero from zero to zero, keep it constant, will vary way one, zero one, and so on. So if n is an input, then that's a problem because it's variable and I don't know how to write a variable number of for loops. Same story as before. So what I'd like to write is for way zero equal to zero up to zero, for way one equal to zero up to one, and so on, convert the sequence way zero through way n minus one into a permutation, an arrangement of a to whatever it is, and print it. All right. So observe that way n minus one is the innermost loop, and that changes fastest, like the rightmost digit of an odometer. And then outer loops change more and more slowly. And that's exactly what's happening here. C is quickly flipping through the possible placement positions, and then B changes one. Okay, so you're tracing through the leaves from left to right. So you're going through different paths in the tree. Okay, so it's clear how this works. So again, the problem is that we don't know how to do variable number of for loops, nested for loops, depending on an input parameter. Okay. But by now, it's clear how to handle this. We already saw that in case of the odometer, we are storing these nested for loops in a vector of indexes. We'll do the same thing here. The only change is the rule of the game. Earlier, you could increase a digit as long as it was less than radix, minus one. This time, you can only increase it up to the upper limit for every corresponding for loop. That's all. That's all that changes. So now, uh, This is how I write the permutation code. Now that I wrote that silly, you know, iterating through numbers code, the pattern is exactly the same. Okay. You don't need to look at it right now, but print perm is nothing but taking the way vector, the vector of the way zero through way n minus one, and turning it into an arrangement of characters and printing them. That's all. It just takes the sequence and makes it out into a character sequence and prints the permutation. Now, the important thing is what you do with next form. Okay. So, if you look at the sequence, if I am here, then I am done. There is no way to increase it further because all indices are at their upper limits. If I am anywhere else, then there must be at least one level where I can move right. Just like I looked at the units digit toward the left and tried to find the first digit I can increase, I'll again start from the bottom, I'll work upward, trying to find an index which I can push to the right. Now, look at what happened in this transition. Suppose I was initially here at 0, 0, 2. I can't increase 2 anymore, but that 0 can be increased. So when I make a transition from 0 to 1, I have to reset all lower indices to the Zero value. So it's very, very similar. There's no difference from counting up except the upper limits are uh, changing depending on the nesting level of the loop. Okay. So this is what we do. So next poem is written as follows. So way has a size, so let n be that size. Again, I have a did change, which is whether you successfully walked to the next path in the tree or you are already at the rightmost path. Okay. So did change is initialized to false. Find the largest index counter we can increment. Largest index is at the bottom. Okay. So for change equal to n minus 1, change greater than or equal to 0, minus minus change. If way change is less than change, that's the important thing, right? At level 2, you can go to 2. At level 1, you can only go up to 1. So change is the level number. So if I can walk to a leaf to, to the right or some node to the right, 
Then I increment way change, just like I incremented 0 to 1, that horizontal arrow. That's what's happening. And I said did change to true, just like before. And then zero out everything with larger index. Fine. So zx equal to change plus 1. So remember this 2 became 0, because this 0 became 1. Okay. So that's what happens here. So from change plus 1 to n minus 1, you set way as x equal to 0. Extremely similar to previous code. The only difference is this. That's the only line which is different. It's not radix minus 1, a fixed radix for all positions, but it's the change, the level number in the tree. And that's it. I break as before, I return did change as before. And main doesn't change at all. So forever, I print the permutation. Okay, For clarity, I can also print the way vector itself. I print the permutation. And if there is no next permutation, I break. Otherwise, I repeat the loop. And there are two arguments. Uh, there's one argument, which is the number of items to permute. Okay. So let's say I uh, give just two items. So what happens? 0, 0, and 0, 1. The first guy can only be 0, remember? The second guy, B can go to the left of A, or B can go to the right of A. Right? The thing on the screen can be obtained by calling it on 3. So 0, 0, 0 corresponds to CBA, and then C is moving to the right. Okay, then 0, 1, 0, again C is moving to the right, nested in. So earlier it used to be BA, then it's AB. The final one is ABC. Okay. So once again, you can quickly uh, at least you know, circumstantially verify if you wrote correct code by giving an input and doing a word count. So you say six permutations of three things. Okay. So you see the number of permutations very quickly. And ch chances are your code is OK if you are getting the right count here. So what have we learned so far? That the configuration space here is a little more complicated. It's not a Cartesian product of different counters. The right hand boundaries are different based on the index of the counter. But you can handle that. You can turn that into a permutation. You get n factorial configurations. Okay. The third uh, example we will look at is more irregular in the sense that there is no clean structure like 1 times, 2 times, 3 times, up to n factorial and so on. And this problem has to do with that semi-magic square. So um, what is a semi-magic square? It contains non-negative integers. Each row and column adds up to the same positive integer C. So in particular, a permutation matrix is a semi-magic square having C equal to 1. So if every row and every column adds up to exactly 1, that's a permutation matrix. Okay. Now. It's possible to prove, although the proof is not entirely trivial, that you can always subtract a permutation matrix from a semi-magic square. If you do that, then the total of C will uniformly decrease to a total of C minus 1. And by induction, unless C minus 1 has become 0, you can keep doing this. So given any semi-magic square, you can keep on subtracting a permutation matrix from it until you zero out the whole matrix. The only problem is that you cannot do this greedily, in the sense that given the original semi-matrix, uh, semi-magic square, you cannot say that for every row, I will greedily choose the column where I place the one for the permutation matrix. Okay. Uh, what do I mean by that? So I have a small example here. So I'll just write this down on a piece of paper that will be easier for us. So here is an example of a, a semi-magic square.
So that's a semi-magic square. Every row and column adds up to five. And suppose you say that, well, I'm going to hunt for a permutation to subtract out of it so that all rows and columns add up to four now. So a tempting algorithm would be that I run down the rows. In every row, I look for the first non-zero. So here I find the first non-zero in the very first column. So I choose the first column to be one. And then I say that, and I freeze the first row. I say I'm decided on row one. In the second row, I find the first one in the second column. So I pick that, I freeze that decision. Similarly, in the third row, I find the first non-zero here, so I freeze that. Now, because this guy has a first non-zero in the second column, which is already covered, I can't do that, so I have to pick the first uncovered non-zero column, so I pick one there. Okay. In this particular matrix, this might succeed in extracting a permutation out of the original matrix, but it's not difficult to create an example, I leave that as an exercise to you, such that if you follow this greedy policy, you will actually paint yourself into a corner. You will actually find that everything you, that can be picked in the last row is already covered. And you should have taken a non-greedy approach. So in this, you have a choice. You could either have taken this or you have taken that. And by greedily taking the left one, you have somehow cut off a solution in the last stage. So you could easily create examples like this. So the summary is you cannot pick the column greedily. Okay. Now, I can always be inefficient and walk through the possibilities like this. The matrix can be somewhat largest. There may be a lot of zeros between two elements. So I want to come up with a sparse representation of the matrix where I have squeezed out all the zeros. So I'll create a new data structure called non-zero columns out of the original matrix called magic, where NZ calls only records the, the rows of, sorry, the columns where non-zeros appear and what their values were. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of possible representations, but here's one. So I'll say that row zero has a non-zero only in column zero. Row one has non-zero in columns one and two. Okay. And so on. This is zero, one, two, three. So suppose I start with this. So I record where the non-zero columns are, fine. And now I have this another vector called column taken. Column taken corresponds to our nested for loop indices. So initially, column taken will be all zeros. We'll be a little silly about this, okay. So it turns out there are far better algorithms to find permutation matrices out of magic, semi-magic squares, but we'll do it along the lines of our iteration scheme. Okay. And then, so it's like, you know, this variable says where I am in this array. This variable tells me where I am in that array. Okay. So column taken at this position can go between zero and zero. Column taken in that position can go between 0 and 1, 0 to 0, 0 to 2, 0 to 2. So now this is the configuration space. Column taken is a vector of indices where each index can go between that lower and upper value. And now it shouldn't be any problem to rewrite my iterator so that column taken passes through all legal values in this NZ calls situation. Fine? So think of writing nested loops involving these five variables and clocking each of them up according to their individual lower and upper limits, right? Now, if I give you NZ calls and column taken together, it's also very easy to figure out if this is actually a solution. 
Why? Because I'm going to run through the rows. I'm going to detect which column you took. I'm going to mark that column with a bit or a count. What should happen is you should hit every column exactly once. If not, it's not a solution. If yes, that's the solution. We look for the first solution. We subtract out that permutation matrix. Once you get a permutation matrix solution, you can always go greedy. You can always subtract that out. You'll still end up with a semi-magic square with total being one less. And by definition, you can keep continuing that. So let's look at how that code looks like. So I'll start off main, and we'll do a top-down design, so you don't need to worry too much about what various functions are doing. So main starts with reading in the matrix called magic. Now magic has to be square, check for that. So nz calls, let's go back to this data structure. So now we have to fill in this data structure called nz calls. So what is nz calls? It maps from a row to a vector of variable size. So this is really a vector of vectors, where the inside vector can be of arbitrary sizes. Uh, it cannot be empty, because to be a semi-magic square to start with, every row has to have some non-zero element in it. So that is how you uh, declare the nz calls variable. Because both boost and C++ standard template library define vector, you have to disambiguate and say which one you want. Okay. So because I have included both those namespaces, and they both define vector. So when you declare things, you have to now tell the compiler which vector you want. So we want std vector, say. So an std vector of std vector of ints, that is nz calls. Okay. So C++'s scanner is in dire straits, so you have to separate this by a blank, otherwise C++ will confuse it with the input-output operator on C in and C out, and okay, it'll get all confused. So okay, it's, it's a duct tape solution, what, cellar tape solution, what can you do? Fine. So you declare nz calls, and you record the non-zero columns from magic into nz calls. We'll see how to do that. This is top-down design, let's not worry about it. It's easy to do. And then there's this state, which is the columns taken. That's just a vector of ints. Okay. Now I resize it to the proper size, all zeros to start with, and now, the basic loop remains absolutely similar to what we have been doing forever. If nz calls and columns taken is a solution, namely it defines a permutation matrix, then print that permutation. Okay. Otherwise, if there is an X configuration, then just repeat the loop. If there isn't an X configuration on nz calls and calls taken, then break. So in this case, I am just cycling through and printing all possible permutation matrices that can be subtracted out of magic, but I'm not actually doing the subtraction. Okay. So feel free to copy the code and then add code here to actually subtract out the permutation matrix and recompute nz calls to continue with the process, but it's very close now. So now let's look at the implementation of, uh, so record non-zero columns is very easy. You just run row-wise and find where the non-zeros are and stash it into nz calls. So is solution, print permutation, and next configuration. So we'll look at is solution and next configuration. Okay. So what is is solution? Is solution declares a vector of integers, which is the number of hits on a column. Okay. It resizes it to whatever the side of the matrix is. And then for each row, I look for the calls taken. Which column am I referring to? And then in nz calls, I look at rx, cx. And I bump up the column, hit for that column. Okay, this is going a little fast, but it's not too difficult to see why. Okay, to going back to the picture will help. So suppose call taken at index one is at one. Then I, because it's one, I go here, so that's column two. So column two is now hit. So you do call hit two plus plus. That's what's going on in this code. It's not too fundamental to the current discussion, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. 
So you find out the number of times each column has been hit, and if any column has not been hit exactly one time, then it's false. If all columns have been hit exactly once, then it, this is a solution. That's all. The important thing is how to go to the next configuration. And it's absolutely similar to whatever was happening before, except that there is no simple formula for the upper limit. The upper limit for each index comes out of the NZ calls data structure. So I look for a row starting from the lowest, size minus one down to zero. If calls taken is less than NZ calls dot size, Rx dot size. Okay. Sorry to have to flip back and forth between two screens, but I didn't have time to work out on the board. So this basically says NZ calls one dot size is equal to 2. NZ calls 3 dot size is equal to 3. Right? So my call taken Rx should be between 0 and less than NZ calls Rx dot size. So I check for that condition. If calls taken Rx can be increased, then I actually increase that call taken and I return true. Okay. And if I have increased that call taken, all lower rows are reset to zero, exactly in pattern with the two earlier examples we have done. And the rest is absolutely identical. I go over to the next configuration if I succeeded. If no call taken can be increased any further, I return false. Okay. So if I run this, and on that specific matrix, So it prints four ways in which you can subtract a permutation matrix from the original matrix. So remember I'm printing all possible permutation matrix configurations which can be subtracted. If it's solution, print the permutation. So let me translate this into a more readable format. So, so that was the original matrix. In some sense, the values don't matter anymore. All you need to know is that it's at least one. So it's just the non-trivial positions which matter. The first permutation matrix that's being printed is 0, 0. Let me make up a grid. Okay. Uh, the first solution printed is 0, 0, 1, 1, um, 2, 3, 3, 2 and 4, 4. Okay. So clearly that is a solution. Any dot here has to correspond to a non-zero here, and there has to be exactly one dot in every row and column. Okay. The second solution my program is outputting is 0, 0. 0, 0 is a constant in all of them, has to be. Um, 1, 1, uh, 2, 3 like before. Um, but now I have 3, 4, and I have 4, 2. Okay. And you can verify that dots are only where non-zeros are, and again, I have exactly one dot in every call and row. Okay. And so on. There are four solutions. Uh, four solutions will come out of the um, iterator. So that's an example. So some of the problems which appeared to be somewhat difficult in earlier labs will, of course, adjust for the hardness. That's a different story. But the important thing is that they were hard because of lack of structure of thinking about the problem. Okay. So once you have this power of managing configurations and walking between them systematically, using whatever state you want, then things become easier to code in many cases. 
Now, C++ itself defines a whole family of iterators. It has, I mean, this is not readable from a distance, but you can go look at the slide offline. There are forward iterators, there are bidirectional iterators, there are random access iterators. On various iterations, you can do various uh, operations like plus plus, minus minus, comparison with things, accessing them, okay? So we'll just look at one small example, which is how to iterate over vectors. But well, there are still time left. Give me another five minutes. So suppose we want to print all elements of a vector using an iterator. Okay. How do you do that? There's a vector of ints called vec, okay, suitably filled. Now the for loop, instead of using ints, uses a different typed object. What is it? On vector of int, you have something defined called an iterator. Okay. And that's called vx. vx is an iterator over vec. You initialize it to vec.begin. So vec dot begin is a special function or method defined on any vector which takes you to the first position. First position actually exists in a non-empty vector. You can also compare vx against vec dot end. Vec dot end is a special meaningless iterator value on the vector. Now you shouldn't ask what vx exactly is, okay? So it's almost like, you know, uh, there was this artist who used, who used to call himself Prince but at one point he decided that he didn't want a name anymore. So if you asked him his name, he just gave a strange symbol on a piece of paper. That symbol wasn't reproducible by newspaper or journalists, so they started calling him the artist formerly known as Prince. Okay. So similarly, you shouldn't ask what exactly is an iterator. You can't print it, okay, it's like the Brahman, okay, you can't describe, you can only talk about the Brahman negatively. Okay. So, but you can do various things with VX. You can compare it against the end to detect if you have finished. You can increment it. So plus plus has been overloaded to means advance the iterator. Just like in our three examples, we're advancing the iterator to the next step that's packaged into a function called plus plus. Yes. In this case, it's like a cursor. But in case it's not a vector or something else, then it doesn't need to be a cursor. We'll see examples of that when we discuss collection objects in C++. So this is very simple, and you access the contents of VX using star VX. The only interesting point is that you can manipulate the contents at VX and maybe delete the element entirely. So let me just quickly show you the last example. Okay. So I create a vector, I push back a bunch of values, zero to four, to be precise, and then I create an iterator, vec.begin, et cetera. I can try to print VX, and that results in G++ being very unhappy. Okay. You're not supposed to print an iterator. Okay. Okay. Just like you shouldn't take pictures of certain people. Okay. So you don't have operator less than less than defined for um, an iterator. So let's delete this statement. But you can print the contents of the vector. Also, if the contents of the vector is two, say, you can choose to erase it from the vector. Now, so one thing you'll observe is that I need to say vec dot erase vx. Why do I need to do that? This is aesthetically displeasing because I've constructed vx out of vec. Vx should know that it's tied to vec. Why did I need to pass vec again? Ideally, I should say vx dot erase. And Java does that. Java has the correct view on life. Okay. But C++ being an old thing, it has to support some legacy reasons why you have to call it on vec. Now, after that, we'll say it is star vx, but you'll observe something funny. So let's uh, now compile this code and run it. If I do that, it says 0, 1, 2. It prints the element, right? Then the element is 2, it erases it, but once you erase it, the iterator is immediately positioned on the next one. So you print a wrong message. It actually erases 2. It didn't erase 3. In the resulting array, okay, if I print that out again, so from scratch in the next loop. And I only print it out like that. You see that the two is gone, not the three. So what happened is as soon as you call it is, VX is repositioned to the next element. So this is pretty handy in coding things like that needle and haystack examples. 
Okay, so Nindle and Hestack can be decoded to now use iterators instead of indices. Okay. So I'll leave you to code that up yourself. We can go over it a little, you know, in the next lecture. But in the next lecture, what we'll do is we'll start with recursion and recursive functions.